Yep. I said it before and I'll say it again. Life moves pretty fast. You don't stop and look around once in a while. You could miss it. You're listening to the podcast, So There I Was. Show number 25 for Thursday, 3 November, 2022. This one's called, Here's to Woody, The Last Worst Day. Oh, my fig. Can you believe we're almost six months into this? No. No. It's really gone fast because it's because we're having fun doing this. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I hope the listeners are having as much fun as we are. This Um, particular episode, uh, you know, as, as you know, it was a carryover from the last one, but it was... Still, just it, time went too fast. I could have listened for hours. It really did. And, and as it turns out, we did. After this episode, I think we've got three more hours with with Lawman. Um, I, I, I will admit, I did what I did is I took an amalgamation. Lawman started talking about the primary subject of this show in our first recording session. And then we sat down for a second time, and we crossed some T's and dotted some I's in the second session. So I pulled those forward. And so I'll take the end of the first session and the end of the second session and put that all together for the last three hours with him. But um, this is not going to be the lighthearted show that you may have grown accustomed to, dear listener. Yeah, it gets real. It, it just gets real. There are some hijinks in there. For instance, uh, at one point, Lawman was taken to a... a landing zone an lz in saudi arabia where he proceeded to sit by himself for two and a half hours <laughs> he dropped off at the wrong lz yeah by no himself. one knew he was there <laughs> so fortunately someone wandered by eventually in a humvee and gave him a ride to where he needed to be going but uh, sir what are you doing here I yeah think was the was the term i heard yeah <laughs> uh, not very much <laughs> i'm waiting around you're going to wait a long time, sir. He had another funny story. Oh, about the being on the ship. Uh, yeah, the uh, the uh, the skipper who was a ghost. He he had two sightings, and the second one wasn't very fun because he got an ass chew. <laughs> I don't know why. It was just wallpaper. Well, it was a wallpaper that was morale oriented for his troops in the uh, mine shack. Yeah, well, ship. yeah, yeah, you know. Troopers got to keep their morale up. Yeah. These guys were uh, months and months at sea, away from family, friends, everything they knew at home, and with they were on a boat with 3,000 other dudes. Yeah, so, this was back before there were uh, <clears throat> females allowed on the ship. There was morale wallpaper. Let's just leave it at that. Yeah. So. <laughs> and then uh, it was one of the first combat sorties that he talked about uh, when they had a uh, – some type of surface air missile explode between the flight at 30 some thousand feet. That got their attention. Yeah. <laughs> what got my attention fig is that they got to 36,000 feet with all that gear hanging on the right. bottom of their airplane. Oh my well, God. That was a trick. That was a trick. Yeah. They were, uh, for those of you that are pilots, you know, that a heavy airplane up at altitude at its max capable altitude is just dancing on the head of a pin up there. And that's where those guys were. And, uh, all of a sudden <laughs> they had, uh, and so we say anti-air ammunition heading their way, and uh, they were out of out of airspeed, out of ideas. That's right. Holy smokes! Uh, and then we get into the meat of the show. Um, so uh, we're we're dedicating this show to the memory of uh, Reg Underwood, Woody. Well, he was a rag instructor when we he was, up, right? yeah. Okay. True gentleman, great guy, super smart, and uh, I just I I am privileged to have known him, and disappointed I didn't get to know him better. So uh, we're dedicating this show to his memory. He's the last American aviator shot down and killed in combat. All right. So uh, with all that, sit back, buckle up, don't sit on the ejection handle, and enjoy. One day you'll see Sitting at a bar He's the one Drinking whiskey And smoking a cigar Pull up a chair And offer him a drink It's a good bet 
he'll tell you exactly Welcome back. We're talking to Lawman from last week's show. Gosh, it's been a long, yeah. it's been yeah, a long so, time. Yeah. Good to see you again, How you been, man. Yeah. How was your week? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Missed you guys, yeah, yeah. man. <laughs> so, obviously, this is a continuation of the recording from uh, from the previous uh, show. But uh, So, we're, we're talking to Lawman, and he was described uh, being in VMA 331 and some of his peacetime exploits. He wound up flying in Gulf War One as well. So, uh, Fig, you were just about to ask him about Yeah, it. so, he you know, he made the comment of uh, the uh, – some of the mishaps that had happened in peacetime and, and, uh, and I just said, well, uh, you're a combat, you're a combat aviator. And I, I, I want to pick your brain to tell us about your combat tour. How, how did, how did it go for you? Where see two, uh, 331, you guys were on a, you were on a boat, right? Yes, that's correct. Yeah. We were on the USS Nassau or the nauseous as we called it, LHA four. Uh, and it was, you know, a short notice thing. I was, a. Uh, um, uh, I got back from West back in 89 December and a guy named uh, Woody, I'll just go call yeah. signs here. Yep. Uh, Woody. Uh, mm-hmm. And I, on the same day, and he was a WTI, extremely competent, really good pilot. On the very same day, we went from BMA 331 to 203 to BIPs. So I was instructor pilot at 203 for fairly, uh, you know, uh, it turned out to be a short period because we got interrupted by Saddam Hussein invading Kuwait right. in the summer of uh, 1990. Oh, man. And so, in fact, to be honest with you, Woody and I had designs of getting out of the Marine Corps at that point. We'd already we'd done a Westpac. We'd done a Mew float. We'd done everything you can in the peacetime Cold War Marine Corps, you know, that you operationally, right? Right. Uh, there was no combat ops. I mean, we didn't do Grenada. We didn't do, uh, you know, uh, Beirut, that kind of stuff, you know. So we're going to pull chocks. Got our ATPs out of, you know, I got mine out of Kinston, North Carolina, flying a piece of shit, Piper Seminole. And, Delta Airlines was, you know, that other airlines were hiring. So, hey, we're going to go to the airlines, majors. And then Saddam Hussein invaded the Kuwait. Um, and four days later, he and I were on, on board USS Nassau. And we were kind of volunteers, if you will. We were, because he and I had previous boat experience from the previous cruise. Not every Harrier pilot, as we all know, gets to go on a boat, especially back when you had debts only, you know, and right. nine guys get to go. And uh, so he, because we had boat experience, we were asked to return to BMA 331 to augment them. 20 jets, 20 jets on the USS Nassau. Yeah, not a net, a whole squadron. A whole squadron, the entire flag, you know, the skipper and everybody, Sergeant Major, all the troops. And they had been preparing to go to uh, Nor- uh, Norway for winter training. Okay. So they had to repack a lot of shit. And now they're going to the desert. So he kissed his pregnant wife, Woody, did uh, pier side down to Morehead City, right down the road here from Cherry Point, right. uh, pregnant with their first child. Uh, and uh, I was married, had two kids, small kids. I flew a jet. So my FCLP is field carrier landing practice. I hadn't been on the boat in, you know, year plus, whatever, you know, two years. Uh, I got the balance at the, one of the pads at Cherry Point, like North Pad. I got four landings, vertical landings at the North Pad. And they go, oh, man, you're now carrier qualified. You know, they waved everything. <laughs> Right. I flew a jet the next day with four drop tanks on it to a vertical landing, sitting uh, pier side almost right off the you know, on the anchor there in Moorhead City, and then we sailed for wow. Desert Shield, which sucked. So you know, all men back then, no women on board the ship. Right, right. You know, uh, I was in a four man stateroom like most pilots. We got lucky. We got four man staterooms, you know, because we were, you know, air crew. I room with uh, Beebs, uh, Scorch, who became an astronaut. Yeah. Uh, uh, great guy, test pilot, astronaut, flew the space shuttle three times. He's at my company now. We're actually trying yeah, to get yeah, him yeah. on here. Yeah, oh, he'd, he'd be a great one. Yeah, Scorch, yeah. Uh, he and I go way back. Okay. So, uh, yeah, uh, he was in my uh, shared room with him and Woody. Uh, and, you know, Desert Shield sucked. We were at sea the first time we said still 100 consecutive days. Wow. No, 100 no days of sea. I was, yeah. Blue water well, ops, 100 days. Blue water ops, yeah. And, you know, flying only daytime. For the most part, I mean, hey, you know, because we weren't, none of us are qualified. None of us said, you know, these are day attack Harriers, uh, yeah. hydromechanical. We didn't have a, uh, no fade the digital no jets. Fade you know, we're all yeah. hydromechanical, you know, so like a carburetor, you know, tweaking the carburetor to get the engine just right. And uh, it was a weird deal. We fought the Navy for months. It was a battle with the with the Gator Navy on, you know, flying shipboard ops, you know, conducting flight ops. Uh, in fact, the skipper, the, the boat was a, a six pilot. We thought, hey, this guy, he's one of us. He's a brother attack pilot. He's going to be right. great. We're going to have a great yeah. skipper. He's hes one of us. He's a 
He's a brown yeah. shoe aviator. He's a naval, naval aviator. Come yeah, on. Yeah, man, he's going he's gonna to love us. You know, he's going to be hanging out in the ready room talking, you know, swapping flying stories and shit. Never saw the guy. <laughs> never. He never once in the entire cruise ever came to our ready room. It was crazy. He was in fact, I thought he, I thought he would he's come on. He by the manlyhood of the I don't know what it was. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Harrier guys. <laughs> He would come on the, uh, you know, the MC, you know, yeah. uh, at night MC, intercom yeah. system. We called it the one MC hammer yeah. back then. And <laughs> he'd make his announcements and stuff, you know, and his, his picture was posted all over the, uh, the ship, uh, the, the plan of the day. So I saw his picture all the time. I heard him on the, the one MC, but never saw this guy. So I made a mission to try to find this guy. His name was called someone Skippy. And for weeks I walked around this POD trying to find his, <laughs> is the captain alive or did the, did the crew kill him? You know, did the Navy crew kill him and throw him overboard and, I was pretending to be the skipper. And so uh, I found him one time. Skipper. Yeah, yeah. I, I walk into the Acclam room. It was like the, you know, I think it was like the, you know, the anchor room. And there's a ping pong table. And there's these sailors playing ping pong. And one guy, khaki uh, trousers, white T-shirt. And I walk by. Oh, my God, that's a skipper. That's, that's the captain. So, hey, sir, are you the captain? <laughs> Yes, I am. Okay, now you're alive. All right. So the next time I saw him, he came through my, I was the power line OIC. So all the engine mechanics and guys that supported the Harrier, uh, the brown shirts all worked for me. And we had a little room off the island. You know, you walk right on the flight deck level. You walk in, you can walk through the flight power line division of the Harrier guys, then get into the island superstructure. And over a period of time, again, no women back then. Right. Uh, these rings started to hang in, you know, Playboy centers, full, uh, full shots on the walls, you know, then a, sure. a naked shot here, a naked chick here, a naked chick here. And then after a while, I got to be like wall to wall to the ceiling <laughs> of naked chicks. Of that's, various... motivation. that's motivational <laughs> purposes. It was kind of motivating. Yeah. And it was, yeah. but some were kind of raunchy. They weren't all, you know, nice penthouse or Playboy. Some were the other, you know. Mm. cherry or whatever they magazine all tastefully day. done <laughs> yeah <laughs> they were not. some of that gets to be a little much <laughs> yeah yeah so one day the we don't need a gyne gynecological class <laughs> yeah some were pretty raunchy i gotta admit so the yeah. one day the door a hatch opens up and the skipper the captain of the ship blows through and he almost makes the other hatch he's going to blow through and go through and we're all attention on deck and he stops and he looks around really slowly <laughs> <laughs> and he goes who's in charge of this place <laughs> Who's in charge here? I said, Sir, Cat, me, me, Captain Hancock. Who's going to see your ass out here right now? So he drinks me in the passageway, chews my ass for this vulgar, offensive wallpaper on his ship. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I want all that stuff down now. And uh, I said, Sir, that's a morale. It's a morale thing. I said, These yes. Marines put a lot of time and effort into that wallpaper. <laughs> I said, You're going to destroy yes. morale. I said, can we, make, can we make a deal? How about like waste up only? Can we keep the waste up stuff? And he actually, I said, I'll tell you what, you can keep the waist up stuff. Everything below the crotch, waist goes away. So, okay. This, but that was a long, miserable cruise up leading up to the actual combat. In fact, it got to the point that, uh, you know, the Harrier uh, single engine, of course, you get a firelight, it's a big deal. And if you recall your procedures in a Harrier and a firelight, if you're anywhere near um, a, uh, a land based airport, you would divert nozzles aft. So yeah, you don't you do, do nozzles aft. That's the source of fire with the action control system. Yep. APU off and do a conventional landing. That Which would, is an that? emergency procedure Which all is an by emergency itself. Procedure. Yeah. Yes, exactly. So we used, I used to pray, my troops tonight, this is no kidding. My power line Marines, I fly <laughs> twice a day, every other day. After uh, two or three months at sea, we'd heard we're near Almasira Island. The Air Force is there. I need a firelight. Exactly. The Air Force had <laughs> women. <laughs> they had beer yeah. and they had telephones, which we had none of that on board the ship. So the plan was Captain <laughs> would get a firelight off the bow and I would divert, turn an emergency, nozzles aft and divert and land at Almasir Air Base where these Marines would come rescue me. And of course, drag this maintenance operation on for days on end while they swapped yes. the engine out. Yes. <laughs> so we would literally, I'm not making this up. We would get on our knees and sincerely pray to God. Before I went flying, need a but please, please, and please, God, give Captain <laughs> a firelight off the bow. You know, not a real fire. Yeah. It's a light. It's a we light. just need a light. Yeah. And so I would get, check the jet, you know, push the master, you know, the you know, lights test. Make sure the light get, wasn't burned out. Yeah. And then I would <laughs> take off and like, oh, come on, man, give me a light. Give me a light, you know, because I knew here your guys that had fire lights, but no fire. Yeah. I knew here your guys are on fire with no fire lights. But anyway, so we were trying to get ashore. But we were stuck on board the boat the entire war. 
We lost our first jet uh, when the war started. Buick, yeah. Puerto Rican guy out of the yeah. Bronx, New York. Great guy. Good looking yeah. guy. Man, I tell you, the women love them. Navy nurses. We first got, we got a, finally got a first uh, port call. Was, a Navy hospital ship was there. And Buick, man, that guy was scorned. He was, man, we were all jealous as hell. He was bringing these good looking Navy nurses back to the stateroom and put some kind of thing around the door. And I'm like, don't come in here. No, nobody comes in here. <laughs> Damn it, Buick. <laughs> and so uh, Buick got killed behind the boat uh, at night uh, on a recovery on the anchor. Catastrophic, something. I don't, his nose, we saw on the plaque camera, his nose just, you know, 600 foot downwind. And his nose just, uh, we were unaided. Now, remember, we, we started flying yeah. unaided at the boat right. with no FCOPs. We got a lecture at the months at sea, the commanding general of the expedition force. I want Harrier pilots qualified to do night close air support. So make it happen. So they handpicked a bunch of us and we just launched out the boat at night, unaided. They attacked jets and wow. got night qualified and we lost uh buick one night in january no was ejection it, wait, he had, was he was that on a, a uh just training or was he coming back training from no it was not a combat sortie it was a non-combat sortie oh, night uh i remember uh when the fireball went off holy cow what the heck was that we two just think two jets just landed <clears throat> vertically behind the boat over the stern approach and i was wondering okay who's in those two jets and who's who was that you know, and did he get out, right? You know, when first thing I go, were you an LSO? I, not at that time. I avoided the, uh, as a Harrier major, I became a uh, advanced and training LSO for 214 okay. later on in life, but I did not okay. want to be an LSO. But not, not on that, uh, not nope. on that. Okay. I can't recall who was in the tower at that time, but uh, Pope we, was an LSO, was he not? Pope was, yes, but he didn't deploy with us. He had a some kind of physiological episode prior to that. So he okay. was not with, or, or maybe during the cruise, we sent him home. I think that might've happened. He got sent home at that point, but uh so we launched it, you know, the Sarbird search and rescue helicopter, Huey, ships Huey went over there and they landed right away because he actually, the ship was on a, on the anchor just off the Omani coast, like four miles off the beach. And the jet impacted right at the shoreline uh, and no ejection. Okay. So Buick was killed. We sent him home in a, in a transfer case. Yeah. Uh, and we started flying combat sorties. So what kind of bothered me a lot was that you know, the other squadrons who were land-based, we're flying from day one, combat sorties. VMA-331 got held back uh, with this amphibious task force. It's this huge deception plan right. initially, which worked. I get, you know, the goal was to tie down multiple Iraqi divisions along the coastline, thinking that this major Marine Corps amphibious task force was going to insult the beaches like Incheon. Right. You know, and it did work. I guess it did strategically. It worked to pin down all these divisions, but we didn't fly in combat initially. And then we uh, got fragged to start flying. So the MEF wanted us to start softening up the beach line a little bit, dropping, you know, hitting uh, artillery sites, AAA sites, whatever else, you know. And so we flew our first combat mission, uh, dark takeoff off the boat, uh, the very first ever launch of Harriers into combat. So it was VMA 331. It was the skipper, myself, Woody, and Pee Wee. Yeah. All right. You remember Pee Wee? Yes. Yeah. Another story there later on, I'll tell you, I flew with the sun. Uh, who was killed in the KC-130 years later, but um, I right. flew KC-130J in Afghanistan with his son, Kevin. But uh, so we took a, we had a night takeoff with the skipper leading it, um, rendezvousing at night off the boat on the North Persian Gulf for a night takeoff, but it got pinky and the weather was dog shit. So we had four Mark 82s apiece. Two of us had uh, defensive electronic countermeasure bots, Deccan bots on board. Yeah. And we climbed to like 36,000 feet. <laughs> Which, which, above this. I know, but you know, with all that gear on there, are you kidding me? I mean, me? power, power right? in the corner, and these are these are hydromechanical fuel controls. So I remember I was a maintenance check flight pilot. I was looking at the corrected RPM, but the the Rolls Royce Tech, John, <coughs> said, don't look at it; it'll scare you. Because I'm giving you, I'm giving you all the power I can. You know, like it's like Scotty on yeah. uh, Star Trek. Yeah. I'm gonna give you all the power. You all she's got. <laughs> yeah. So I remember looking at the engine page and go, "Oh my God." <laughs> This engine yes. in Alaska, it was just screaming. Right. But he was giving us all the power we had. And we, uh, so being Marines on our very first combat flight, uh, our primary target was socked in solid undercast, uh, high 30s, mid 30s, secondary target completely socked in. So what do we do? We press to our tertiary target. Of course. Uh, of course. We want to we want to kill something, man. We want to drop something. Well, yeah. And so we went further north than we should have gone. 
with no support, no nobody, just four stupid Harrier guys, couple deck and pods off the boat, yeah. you know, <laughs> and um, and uh, we started getting. This, I ask, what could go wrong? Yeah, what can go wrong? So we started getting SA two indications from our eleven o'clock. Woody picked them up first. So we're in battle box, right? Yeah, you know, about a mile apart from each other, battle box. Yeah. Yep. Like 35, 36,000 feet right above a solid undercast. And all the tech manuals and all studying history says do not fly over a solid undercast. Ever. If there's radar missile threats. Because Ever. Why? Because yeah. you can't see the launch. You can't see a, a, a missile trail. You can't see the missile. Scott Don't do O'Grady that. that Scott O'Grady will tell you how that works. There you go. Yeah. We ignored all that. Hey, we're going to go north, man. We're Marines. We're going to kill something. And then it went from, uh, remember the uh, go like from semi, you know, the critical and tell you, hey, this radar is looking at you. And we got uh, engaged by an SA-2 at about 36,000 feet. And it actually, I'm wondering if it actually was a missile or just a, or they're looking at us, you know, trying to get us to jettison and turn back. But a, an actual SA-2 came out of the clouds, flew underneath my jet in the middle of the battle box and detonated. Uh, nobody got fragged because of the... Uh, the uh, countermeasure pods worked. We think that's what, you know, they, they created that memory, the acceptable miss distance. Right. Right. You know, so we all, you know, doing like, you know, G and a half, two G's and maneuvering tones going, I got no, I'm putting out chaff in flares no, at 36,000 yeah. feet. Chaff and no authority up there. Yeah. No turn. Yeah. Yeah. yeah the pig, jet was a pig, you know, it's barely flying. Oh my God. So the skipper said, Hey, join on me. He had a target. We went to fingertip after we, the, the missile had blown up and uh, we all joined the <laughs> fingertip on him. And when he got a solution, auto solution on some, Iraqi regimental headquarters. Uh, we all pickled with him. And so 16 Mark 82s from like 35,000 feet. You know. <laughs> and then we turned like cowards and ran back towards the, the bolt. <laughs> and buff and, it. Uh, go, 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 go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, our best turn. <laughs> and no BDA, of course, because the only BDA I can give you for that was that we know the bombs hit the ground because of gravity. That's about it. You know, <laughs> other than that. But, you know, fast forward. So that was our introduction to the war. Uh, and I tell you that story because fast forward the last day of the war, February 27th, uh, I was leading the same division off the boat early in the morning again, but the ground war had started. Uh, the Iraqis were, were running and it was me, Pee Wee, Mystic and Woody. Night launch over the Persian Gulf, pinky, sun's coming up. We get assigned a target, lat long. You punch it in, you do an alpha, you know, alpha check. You know, so that lawman shows the target bearing, you know, yep. you know, three, three, zero for uh, 72 miles. Everybody says, yeah, two, three, four. You all agree. Uh, we're talking to a two seat F-18 fastback Ford air controller who's telling us that he's in the target area and that he has not seen any surface air missiles because we had had already had four Harriers got shot down. Prior to this, we knew that missiles were a big threat to the Harrier, you know, single engine. Yep. You get hit, you're going down. Nobody was surviving. Yep. Yeah. A Harrier uh, with any type of explosive ordnance yeah. hit on the not, jet. Not, not, taking, not taking BDA and coming back. No, no. F-18s got hit. Five Marine Hornets got hit. They all flew back in Saudi Arabia. You know, other, uh, you know, they shot down A-10s, F-15E. The senior uh, POW was an F-15E strike eagle, full bird colonel. So they were shooting down A-6s, Tornados, everybody. Yeah. But a lot of jets are also coming back with battle damage, not right. the Harrier. Not knocking the Harrier. But you got no survivability. It's, it's a design. It's, yeah, well, it's, 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 it's that airplane's all about weight, and there's no spare room, man. It, there's no, you know. yeah, yeah, no redundancy, no self sealing fill tanks. Your World War II fighter attack airplanes had better redundancy and survivability than the AVB here. I honestly got truth. The only thing we could do is don't get hit, and they increased the, the chaff and flare bundles from uh, you know sixty right. to one hundred eighty, give you more expendables, you know, later on. Yeah. But yeah. your bottom line is don't get hit. Don't right. get hit in the Harrier. <laughs> and so, uh, but now we're flying, you know, and so he said, hey, I, I see some light AAA, but no SAMs. Come on down. So we circled. I joined them up in fingertip. I was leading it. And we spiraled down over the Persian Gulf because it's like Vietnam. If you get the U.S. Navy owned the water, right? Yeah. By that yep. point, there was no threat over the water. U.S. Navy owned the water, feet wet. We broke out below 5,000 feet. Battle box pushed north, crossed over the Kuwait uh, shoreline north of Kuwait City, crossed over the highway of death. We've been dropping bombs on for several days. It's just a right. mess of vehicles and stuff. And uh, the F-18 said, hey, targets of opportunity, 
anything you see moving north of this line, you know, friendlies are here, go north of this line, it's all enemy. If it's a, if it's a military vehicle, it's Iraqi. Kill it. Not going to mark anything. Take out what you see. So I crossed a highway and I was getting ready to tip in. Now we are below a solid 5,000 foot overcast now, which is high threat okay. again. And I knew yep. we knew this is not smart. Yep. We also You're have highlighted. Marines on, we're highlighted, yeah. but we have Marines yeah. on the ground now. So the, to us, the, the acceptable risk level was elevated. We would not have done that earlier in the war. It would have been stupid. And a Harrier to be below where everybody can shoot at your AAA and IR missiles, heat-seeking missiles. But with sure. Marines on the ground, we felt a little more compelled to, hey, let's take a higher risk. And I'm, the skipper agreed to do it. I'm not, I'm, you know, uh, and two, the other two guys, Pee Wee and, um, and Woody were both patch wearers, weapons tactics instructors. I was the junior guy in the flight. And they all agreed, hey, let's go. Let's go. Follow me, follow along, man. So we went in, ducked in. I was just getting ready to tip in from the west side of the highway on some Iraqi vehicles moving north. And we got an abort call. All I heard was abort on our TAD frequency, the radio frequency. Yeah. And it's like, you hear abort, what do you do? You abort, right? Because who's calling that, right? Yeah. So I came off hard left towards the west, away from the highway. PB behind me, Mystic and Woody. And also we get the uh, SAMs, you know, smoke in the air SAMs. Oh, Every man break, break, you know, so move your jet, you, just, you know, move your jet, right? Uh, chaff flares, no raw indications. You no. Know, so obviously, um, you know, would have been heat seeking missiles. It's a man pad at this point. Well, that, yeah, that or nines or 13s. So somebody, I saw two missiles that looked like really nice trajectory. They weren't like course screwing. Okay. They looked like they were pulling lead. Like there was some pretty good missiles, you know. Uh, what do you got hit left hot nozzle? So right, you know, mid fuselage, right below the wing. Woody. Yeah. Dash four, gets hit, pitches up on fire, says, hey, I'm hit, I'm hit, I'm hit. Goes into the goo immediately. Mystic ch- uh, is getting chased by missile. He pulls up into the goo. Peewee and I stayed in a hard left turn below the clouds. I remember turning back all the way around through south, turning back through east and looking north. And Mystic asked Woody, hey, if you're in control, turn your jet southeast. Turn it southeast. Yeah, head because towards again, water. If you can, exactly. If you can milk that jet water. towards the water – and you eject, the U.S. Navy is going to pick you up. The U.S. Navy is going to pick you up. Right. So what he said is uncontrollable. His last radio transmission, it's uncontrollable. Oh, shit. Uh, I happened to be looking north, and I'm sure Pee Wee saw it too. I can't remember now, to be honest with you. Uh, when his jet came back out of the clouds, nose buried and impacted the desert floor just north of us in a huge fireball. So I'm thinking, holy shit. You know, but I thought he, he, you know, he got out, right? Yeah. He made two radio calls. He's right. in the goo somewhere and a parachute. But to me, right. the truth is, it was like a really bad movie, you know. And uh, to be honest, I just watched a few weeks ago, I watched the new Top Gun movie right. with my oh, wife. Yeah. 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 And uh, it was entertaining. I think it was probably certainly better than the first movie. But, you know, and it was Dark. Hollywood, right? Just some Hollywood bullshit in there, you know. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but I got to admit, it got to me. Uh, four jets off a U.S. bolt attacking a target. Sam's in the air. Of course, he had multiple, you know, yeah. uh, and a uh, guy gets hit. But in Top Gun, Maverick, whatever it's called, it's a good news story <laughs> in the end because you all get back to the boat and they're high fiving each other and everybody's talking. You know, that's cool. Sure. That's a great. They lost a jet or two, right? Two jets, but they all and they killed the target and they all make it back. And that's that's a good Hollywood ending. Uh, it's not, it's not always life. that way not, in reality. It's not real life. So, nah, so anyway, uh, we stayed on scene for a while and. No parachute, no seat beacon. But even in peacetime, we had to hear your guys who had ejected in peacetime, and the seat beacon, seat beacon didn't work. Right. You know, it never transmitted as designed. So that's not okay. I knew that. It's not Doesn't mean he didn't get out. Right? Yeah. yeah. And so we even took a wind check, thinking, hey, the wind favors him if he's ejected. At, you know, above five thousand feet, the wind is going to push him towards the Gulf, the Persian Gulf. And then, man, he's got. So P, we say, hey, bingo, bingo minus two, bingo minus three. I go, damn, we got to go. You know. And so we. He turned it over to an F-18 who was racing up north, gave him the on-scene command, went back to the boat, and uh, landed three jets on the boat. And, of course, soon awesome. they land my jet. And I'm thinking about his wife. Now, now, Woody's daughter, he kissed his pregnant wife goodbye. She was born during Desert Shield. Right. Uh, he had a, so he had a five-month-old baby girl. He had pictures of taped to his wall next to his rack, you know, in our stateroom. 
Yeah. Yep. And letters maybe. from home, maybe a videotape VHS or something like that, but it never seen his baby girl. Right. Right. And so I'm thinking about her and his wife on the way back to the boat thing. I knew, I knew his wife for five years, you know, go, damn it. And, uh, we land our jets and I landed, it chained me down. And my Marines, we, do, we dropped our bombs on a secondary target because you, you can't land with 500 pound right. bombs back on the boat, right? Vertically. Yep. Right. So we did a dump target, landed, and the Marines said, Hey, sir, where's, uh, where's Captain Underwood? And I said, uh, He got shot down. They didn't believe me. My own Marines didn't believe me. Come on, sir. Did he divert yeah, no, Come on, where is he? Really? Oh, yeah, don't, mess, don't mess with us, man. Come on. I said, I'm looking, I'm still strapped in my jet looking down and go, Hey guys, there's a war out there, you know. We're trying to kill them. They're trying to kill us. And they got Captain Underwood. Yeah. Nobody believed it. Yeah. Yeah. We went inside, debriefed the intel real quick. We we're scheduled to fly three times that day. Same division. And I didn't like divisions at all. I preferred sections, but our squadron ops so nobody else really believed in it. And I got it because if one jet goes down, you still got a light division, right? You know, sure. if you go yeah. one jet yeah. goes down, you're not gonna launch a single. So I get that, but it was Managing four jets off the boat through all the command and control wickets and the weather and the fog That's of war. Lot. That's a lot. a lot. It's too yeah. hard. So Skipper says, Loman, you're going to fly again. I go, yeah, I'm going to fly again. And he goes, okay, you're going to lead this next division. You're going to lead me and uh, Pee Wee again. I go, no, I don't want to be the lead. Because <laughs> go back historically in combat decades ago, I mean, World War II, is Israelis, Vietnam, usually it's dash last, Right. Yeah, if everybody yeah. gets the element of surprise over the target area and lead maybe gets off and then they know we're coming twos and threes and pair, fours and pairs. Yeah. Right. They're looking. Right. They're right. looking for trailers. And Woody, a really co- accomplished pilot, gets hit as dash four. I said, I don't want to be the lead. I want to be dash last. That yeah. means he goes, nope, if you're going to fly again, you're going to lead us. And I go, oh, shit. So I said, okay. So we all led the next division with the three of us off the boat. Uh, and while we were airborne coming back from our target and the weather got worse, they shot down an F-16 that morning. They shot down a Black Hawk with that female flight surgeon on board who became a POW. Yeah. Right. Uh, the weather got worse. Um, and they, we talked to an F-8, uh, excuse me, an Air Force guy. Say, hey, we're talking to your women on the ground. We're going to launch a search and rescue party and go get them. CSAR, combat search and rescue. We're going to get them out about two hours. I'm like, hallelujah. Thank you, God. The war is almost over. What do you got bag? He's going to have a great story to tell. The Air Force is going to pick him up. Thank God for the U.S. Air Force. But they're good at that, right? They're really sure, good at yeah. combat search yeah. and rescue. And they're going, to, they're going to put people's lives online to go pick up a downed aviator. Well, anyway, got back to the boat. I was excited. They went in. They didn't get them. They couldn't authenticate, of course. Yeah. It was bullshit. They took some fire. And I'm guessing we did a debrief a year later, me and the uh, – F-18 guys did some homework, some intel research, especially the, the backseater. We debriefed El Toro uh, when I was flying eight four mics a year and a year plus later. And uh, the best we could surmise was that, of course, the Iraqis knew they shoot down an American airplane. They got that going for them. Yep. So they know we're going to come get, if they think there's a pile on the ground, we're going to come get them. And they know that too. Yeah, it's and a trap. Our ra- yeah, and our radios broadcast in the clear. 243 Oh, 2828 or 1215, all in the clear. Anybody at the Radio Shack ra- radio can monitor and transmit or receive on those frequencies, correct? Right. Yes. So they, um, we're surmising again. It's all speculation. He did, he did make two radio calls. So if the Air Force said they're talking to a guy on the ground afterwards, it was not Reg Underwood. Would he? Yeah. yeah. I know that for a fact, and I'm, I can tell you why after, but... Uh, uh, it was somebody who probably went to, I don't know, maybe went to college in the United States as an Iraqi student and was very fluent uh, yep. and could, could speak English, English with, with not, a, with not yeah. a horrible accent. Yeah. So, hey, Ahmed or whoever, you are now Magic 04. They're looking for Magic 04. Tell them you're Magic 04. Come get me. I'm on the ground. I'm alive. Come get me. Right. But you can't authenticate. Right. Right. So they didn't get them. That was a trap. And they were, yeah, it was a trap. When they released the POWs, including yeah, was a Yaz, two, the three, 311 guy got bagged. It was a POW. Yeah, the uh, 230 and, R231 guy. Um, yeah, uh, Bart. Bart, yes. Yeah, two-star. Yeah, great guy. Yeah, yeah. Bart. Yeah. Was, uh, so they released two Harrier POWs who had been missing in action. And we thought they had Woody. They don't have them. They released all these POWs, Brits, Americans, Kuwaitis. They go, we don't have this guy. And so 
days later, an army tank division going through that part of southern Iraq where he got, he got hit came across wreckage, Harrier wreckage. I got pictures of that too from later on, but, uh, you know, parts of airplanes and stuff. And, and they came, they said, we got an intact parachute. So, oh, great. We get a message back saying, hey, we got a parachute near the wreckage. Okay. So even more evidence that he got out of the jet, right? Right. So this congressman from Kentucky is telling his mother, brother, sister, wife, who's got a little baby girl that, hey, yeah. he's alive. We're going to get him back. He's a POW. They don't get him back. And so they go, what the heck? So the Marine Corps sent two frogs in there from Gray's registration troops. And they landed and they went through to get pick up personal effects, human remains, and crypto gear was their mission. That's it. No investigation. Just get get that stuff and get out of there. Get evidence and go. Yeah, because it was you know they're still in southern Iraq and it was you know there's a treaty right now you know truce but get in and get out. And they came back and uh, sent a message to the boat saying we have what we believe are the remains of Captain you know Woody. Yeah, we didn't believe it. So my skipper said, "Hey, can you fly off the boat and go see what they got?" Dahran Fleet Hospital Five. So I threw on a you know uniform. A uh, backpack, uh, had a set of orders taking me to Saudi Arabia and a Marine Corps 53 Echo. And I got bless Marine Corps helicopter pilots, right? You know, these guys fly me off the boat into some landing zone, supposed to be Sand Hill or something like that, or Eagle on the Saudi coast. And we land and they take off and the dust clears, you know. I'm standing in the middle of this empty LZ, like nobody around me, not a truck, not a bicycle, not a with radio. A back, with a backpack. Yeah, with a backpack on the coastline going, what the hell? Hey, no wait. Radio, you know, no radio, no cell phone. I go, what the hell? There they go. Just dropped me off and yeah. left me. And uh, I waited like two hours in this friggin' desert shoreline LZ. And some, finally some Humvee comes totally hopping up and some land scrubbers. Goes, hey, sir, what are you doing here? I go, I'm at landing his own sand hill, right? Waiting for his. The, oh, no, it's not land. Sand hill is his eagle or whatever. I go, what the hell? They dropped them in the wrong friggin' LZ. Well, of course they did. So, yeah, of course they did. So I hitchhiked to a regimental headquarters, and they got me to Fleet Hospital 5, okay. where I went through a body bag uh, with, uh, that they said they claim were Captain, you know, it was Marine Harrier Captain. Yeah. So I didn't believe it even, so I opened this bag up, and the first thing I saw, I don't know if I can be too descriptive here, but uh, it was a piece of a skull, you know, mm. with hair on it. Yeah. All right. I'd flown with Woody for five years, Westpac, uh, Guam, shared a state room with him. I knew his underwear. I knew everything about him at right. that point, and I recognized right. his hair. Yeah. You know, oh, boy. If you're holding yeah. a piece of your buddy's yeah. skull inside your hand in your, uh, in your hand with hair in it, you know this yes. is him. That's, That's it. Rough. I mean, but plus, it was AVB torso harness with the old box. Remember, we were the only jet that had right. old box yeah. on board. Right oxygen generating system right. and it was right. an avab torso harness it was bent and burnt and twisted portion was nine millimeter pistol actually which i which i've kept to this day i don't know if you can see this yeah oh shit Look that's at that. that's that's his nine mil pistol that was in that dirt and debris body oh, bag yeah. wow. if you're wearing this strap to your chest and it's all you have left that's yeah. indicative of a of an impact that's pretty right. high. Uh, that's pretty high energy impact, right there. Yeah, blue and burned off it in some places. Yeah, yeah. It was yeah, it was full of dirt. Yeah. Um, so you can imagine, uh, wasn't much else, but uh, the parachute was there. They had. Go, Let me see this parachute. I don't understand. I don't understand that. Part. Well, exactly. So let me tell you about the parachute. All right. Okay, because what the hell, man? He got. A, we heard him make radio calls. The Air Force said they're talking him on the ground. We got a parachute. How can this be? Woody. Yeah. I got this be Woody. Yeah. And so I get the parachute and I'm a jet pilot, Harrier guy. We all, we all know the seat pretty well. You know, yeah. I've been around seats and ejections and other guys that got out and, and, uh, the parachute was fully intact, not a burn mark on it, fully intact, every panel pristine, but the spreader gun had never fired the ballistic spreader gun. Remember when you eject, yeah. the first thing happens, canopy shatters. The right. seat starts to go, a drogue parachute fires and pulls a pin, which de ballistically deploys the spreader gun, which spreads the parachute quickly in a 360-degree radius, especially for the Harrier. If you're low and right. slow, you want a parachute over your head. 
right now. Right. The right. spreader gun had never fired. That parachute had simply been knocked free of the headrest on ground impact and had been flung free of the fireball. Okay. So the parachute was, in fact, intact near the wreckage. Wow. But had never been used in right. an ejection sequence. You understand? Wow. Right. Now, yes. I understand it. You, if you'd seen it, you said the same thing. But a, a grunt, a, an army tank guy, you know, Abrams yeah, tank it's guy. It's a parachute. It's a parachute. Hey, it's parachute. It's, 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 yeah, somebody came yeah, down where, in it. Where, where's right. the pilot? Where's the pilot? The <laughs> Rockies must have them, right? Right. I had to convince everybody, including my skipper, that I was with the remains of Woody, and he was yeah. killed in action, did not eject. Yeah. Nobody believed right. me. And rightfully so, anyways. So that was uh, the end of the war, but it ended, on, of course, on a very sour note. You know, uh, that that was your so, last combat mission that day. That uh, no, the 20- one, the second one we flew uh, without Woody with the light division, me and Mystic and Pee Wee. Yeah, uh, was the last last sortie. Yeah, and then they uh, that was 20- fact, that that same February. afternoon, the uh, CFAC, you know, the Air Force General in charge of all the air war, canceled the rest of the. Uh, ATO. ATO, no, yeah. They we're done. Can't, except for maybe mandatory missions. Everything else stopped. So at that point, I was happy because, again, hey, Woody's, we thought he had ejected, was alive. You know, he's going to have some, some great stories to tell his wife and kid and potentially grandkids. It didn't turn out that way. Uh, you know, so I took him and a dead Army First Sergeant and a Marine Lance Corporal who were ready to be transported back to the States. It was the highest priority for transport back to Colonus or human remains. Right. I signed for three guys, flew to Germany, then on the Dover, Delaware, where they processed the dead. And that's a whole other story about how they, how they uh, do an autopsy on pilots because so it's different. Yeah. So you didn't go back to the boat at that point in time. You just, what, what, no, I never right? went back to the boat. I didn't, I wasn't expecting, I was expecting to go say, oh, this is bullshit. You don't have red gender. You know, so you don't have Woody yeah. here. Right. You get the wrong guys. It's, it's an Iraqi soldier. The jet fell down popping or Bedouin or something. And Woody is a POW. The Iraqis have him. We're going to get him back. I got on board a truck with three transfer cases to uh, Riyadh, jumped on a C-5, empty C-5, flew to Germany, then to Dover, where they processed the dead. And because he's a pilot, uh, they do a full autopsy. They got to determine cause of death. Was he you know, killed in the impact? And back then, DNA was kind of sketchy anyway, so they didn't have yeah. – they couldn't do a DNA – but they do, I understand, they want to do a positive medical ID, right? Right, okay. I got that. I want. I was certain in my mind, but nobody believed me. I don't blame them, you know? Let's get, let's yeah. do it. And they well, try to do too much. Too. Yeah, there was too much, uh, albeit bullshit, counter, counter evidence. At the point. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and, and of course, everybody hopes. You, you know, It's not just the evidence, but you hope, you hope he's alive. And denial is a big part of it, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, big time. So uh, they do an autopsy and they... Um, and they sent for his dental x-rays at Cherry Point. And they got a positive medical ID. Uh, and then here's, a, you know, I'm not knocking the Air Force. You know, they got a tough job. Uh, the guys that do the, uh, you know, mortuary affairs in Dover. Yeah. Right. Uh, I watched them process the dead for several days there, including soldiers and other Marines in uh, various states, uh, different ways they died, combat. Including some were fully intact. They, they put a nice dress uniform on them, open casket. looked like, you know, like you stand there. You know, I mean, laying there. Yeah. Uh, and then some of them were, you know, non-recognizable uh, and uh, sure. non-viewable remains, I call it. But they sure. they uh, have a uniform shop and they do a full uh, uniform, dress uniform. So they put what is remains in this beautiful casket and they laid these army wool blankets over it. Like, you know, like you had back in the day, you make your rack, you know. Right. Uh, wool yeah. blankets over like a human, like, and they make a human shape, like a mummy shape best they can over the remains. Okay. You know, and then they have a tailor shop and I watched them and they, they, they made him a brand new full set of dress blues. No shit. His, maybe wings of gold, his ribbons, including uh, medals, including a purple heart, air medal, everything else. He would have they had his records. They know exactly what he rated yeah. in terms of ribbons and medals. And they laid that reverently over the wool blankets. And they closed the casket and they marked it non-viewable remains with the intent to never be opened again. Right. Wow. But still buried with a full set of dress blues. 
That's pretty awesome. That would have been the same for an Air Force, Air Force sure. soldier, yeah. sailor. Yeah, full set of you know dress uniform over your remains, and no one's ever. Oh man, I never knew. I never knew that. And, I and never that's, knew they that's, did that either. That is no, that I, is I didn't impressive. know. That. You know, I mean, it, I it was impressive. Yeah, so I watched him do that. I watched him close the casket up, and I thought, okay, we'll never see this again. But uh, so then I, I was talking to Pope, who was the Keiko casualty assistance calls officer, right? So yep. they always yep. assign somebody to the family to take care of these matters. And Pope, another hairier guy, was assigned to the to the wife, widow, working on it. And we're talking back and forth, and he said, "Hey, you know, there's a fairly significant uh, uh, life insurance policy, you know, private that will pay." Um, as a result of him having been killed, but not as a crew member, it has to be combat. If he was a crew member, it won't pay. I mean, if, if, aviation accident, excuse me, you know what I mean? Oh, if it's okay. an accident as a crew member, it doesn't, it's, it doesn't have yeah, an aviation but if, clause. But if it's a combat loss, combat, it's it'll pay. I said, hey, no, I said, no problem. He was shot down, killed in action. No yeah. problem. You're, so you're, you're pretty much an I, eyewitness to that. Oh, yeah, yeah. So last thing I get, I'm looking, waiting for the death certificate from the Air Force, right? Oh, Mortuary Affairs. shit. I get this death certificate from this Air Force colonel, I know hands it to me, and I read it very carefully, and it says, cause of death, blunt force trauma, uh, impact with the ground, accident, aviation accident, essentially. I said, no, 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 no stop. No, no. Yeah. No. If you had another guest, colonel. <laughs> I said it was yes, blunt force trauma is correct, yeah. Yeah. but caused due to an accident. Due to a an Iraqi, you know, I mean Russian made, but an Iraqi yeah. surface to air missile yeah. hit his airplane yeah, and shot fine. him down. The jet was un uncontrollable and for some reason he could not get out. And this is speculation there. Was he yeah. injured in the cockpit personally? Was the seat damaged? Yeah. Why did he? Been. You know, he's going to pull the handle. You know, a guy like Woody is going to pull the handle. He's got a wife. He's got a five-month-old baby girl. He's not going to ride a crippled jet into the dirt, right? No, no. Yeah. He's going to pull that handle. You yeah. talk to Bart, another hairier guy who shot down. Yes. If I got it right, he was negative G, inverted spin type thing, out of control. He had to fight, but he got hit at altitude, probably about fifteen thousand feet or so. He had time to push away from the top of the canopy to get to the handle. Remember the hair only has a lower handle. You have to right. reach that lower handle. Right. Pull it or you're not going to get out. So I don't know what, what state Woody was in and his jet out of control. When he said it's out of control, uncontrollable. Right. He, he could have been negative G pinned up against the canopy, couldn't reach but, the handle. But lower altitude, couldn't get out, uh, negative G, or pulls a handle and seats damaged. Right. Yeah. From the warhead, fragmentation, right. or right. he can't pull them. I don't know. But you can see, based on this one I told you, there's no doubt about it. He was in the jet of the impact. Yeah. So, so did the paperwork get? Well, I, I had to argue. We had to pull a conference together. I had to convince other Air Force officers. I was pretty upset. I said, I'm not leaving here until that paperwork says cause of death, killed in action, enemy fire, right. or words of that effect. Yeah. And the Air Force did the right thing. Oh, well, good. that's good. And changed oh, it. Oh, shit. So, <laughs> so I took uh, – here's the ironic thing. Woody really wanted to be an air, a major airline guy, and he would have been, yeah. no doubt about it. Yeah, and he really kind of favored Delta at that time. For whatever you know, good airline didn't have a B scale. You know, had a good good sure. reputation. Never furloughed yeah. anybody in the history of the company. And right, he's a Lexington, Kentucky kind of guy. Grew up in Kentucky, and Delta flew in and out of there. So he was really, I think, had his heart set on Delta. And so it's kind of ironic that the Marine Corps whoever fragged it, uh, I escorted them home to. Lexington to be buried on a Delta Airlines flight. So his last flight was with Delta yeah. oh, to right. his hometown to be buried. Anyway, so that's that's kind of the extent of our desert storm, you know. And we lost another jet uh, behind a boat at night on the way back after the war. Is that Manny? Huh? No, Manny Buick. That's Manny. Buick was Manny who was killed in, in, in uh, prior to uh, combat operations by BMA-331. Then Woody was tragically killed 22 hours prior to the ceasefire. Can you imagine that? No. 22 hours. I had to go yeah. to his mother's house and explain to her and his brother and sister what had happened basically and that uh, you're going to bury your brother and son, even though they've been told by the K uh, Kentucky congressman that your son is alive. We're going to get him back. Damn. Mom and the brother and sister wanted to go open the casket. No. I wanted, yeah, they want to see you. They want to see 
Yeah. yeah. You, you eat know? deer. I want to see my son's face. You know, I had to try to explain in her mother's living room why you don't want to do that. And she was really upset about that, of course. And she said, you convince his brother and sister and I won't open the, the casket. And then, then his widow shows up hours later holding a little five-month-old baby girl in her arms. Oh comes gosh, through the back door. I had to face her. You know, well, oh, yes. man, this is horrible. Yeah, man, I'm, I'm sorry. I know it's supposed to be funny <laughs> stuff here, but it's, it's No, no, just, no. Yeah. This is no. This is okay. This is good, too. We promised is, uh, when we started it was going to be yeah. funny, uh, but also tragic and poignant. Yeah, you know, and, and here's the good and the mm-hmm. bad news. That was December. Excuse me. That was, uh, he got shot down yes. February 27th, 1991. Early in the morning. Yep. And it was um, about 22 hours later, the ceasefire went in effect. Thankfully, thankfully, right? right? Everybody else is out, you know, we're stopped shooting at each other at that point anyway. And I was so elated by that. But uh, to this day, Woody remains the last, very last U.S. military, Air Force, Navy, or Marine Corps tactical jet pilot to be shot down and killed in action by enemy fire. Think about that. Scott O'Grady got out. Yep. Uh, heck, a former uh, former Air Force four star uh, F sixteen guy got shot down by Serbs. Uh, so almost thirty two years. Ago. And uh, he got out. That's, that's uh, a good. Other thing. guys. That's a good record. It's good. But the yeah, last guy, yeah. tragically, guys we all most of us knew. Yeah, I actually got Harry- to fly with Woody. Woody, Woody, yeah. and I. Uh, yeah. Uh, he, he probably instructed up- you at two hundred three because he was there. At yeah. When he, he was yeah, good. He right. actually took me on a ride before I started. I got to ride in his back seat, and he was leading a uh, four plane bombing sortie. We went out and did that, and we had a, we had. A, on Mark 76, and uh, he, uh, we, we come in and uh, landing. He, he goes to taxi across the center mat for a ta- another takeoff. I go, uh, can we do that while I'm learning? And he goes, oh, crap, no. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot. Thanks, man. <laughs> oh, yeah, man. <laughs> but he was, yeah, he was a really good guy, smart, funny. Here's a oh, Jedi Knight, and here's where you go back to combat. Yeah, and I'm sure Jedi you- Knight. You know, and here's where you go back to combat. I've seen this. Uh, I did a lot of combat tours after, you know, in both OAF and OEF. I did a year and a half in Afghanistan, for example, but uh, both flying and on the ground. And, uh, you know, you want to be good, right, at your job. Yeah. But lucky, man. You want to be lucky, too. Oh, absolutely. You know, because yeah. sometimes it matter what jet you were in, what piece of sky, or if you're on the ground, where you stepped, where you stood, what vehicle you're in, where you were seated. When a blast goes off, rounds are coming down. I mean, really, sometimes it does boil down to luck. It is a basic tenet of <laughs> naval aviation, right? It's better to be lucky than good. Than lucky than so, good, yeah, yeah. Now, I don't remember if you said this. I think you did. That you Did you swap places with him for that flight? Yes, yeah. That, that's part of the uh, – that's part okay. of it. Yeah, we were uh, on, the, on the schedule to have the, the skipper, uh, Mystic, leading it, and I think then – Woody was two, I think Pee Wee was three, and I was dash four. But the, uh, but you know, you could always, you always mix it up. You know, the leads uh, you don't know, sure. adhere to the what's written on the schedule. But uh, Woody had been asked by the skipper to lead it that night, uh, the night before. Uh, hey, you know, hey, I want you to lead this division. Um, and Woody came to my our stateroom we shared with uh, Beebs and uh, Scorch, and said, "Hey, lawman, it's not up to it." tomorrow morning if you lead the first one i would appreciate it and then i'll lead the next two or three three uh, sorties that day and you know the truth is leading a four ship off the boat uh, especially a, a, a night if you will night takeoff unaided back in the day of course as yeah. a storm time frame uh and you know, what do you mix, mean by unaided tell, tell no me. goggles you know so right. you're flying you're not flying any yeah. night vision goggles we didn't have any night vision goggles you're flying the day attack harrier so no night Devices on the jet, nothing on the helmet. There's a black bowl of soup out there going out yep. and hopping. And, <laughs> and, a, and, a, and a cold nose jet, which means no radar. You know what I mean? Right. Say, say Hornets, maybe off the boat, uh, have some radar SA on your know, radar trail rendezvous at night. Uh, if they weren't aided either, another, you know, the radar is a pretty good tool. Uh, you're right. taking off in a hair, your four ship at night off the, off the pointy end of the boat uh, with other ships out there, carriers and in fact, our first combat rendezvous was a night takeoff in the morning. I say, you know, uh, pre-dawn takeoff, yeah. and I rendezvoused on a jet based on where I thought the skipper was going to be uh, on attack and radio, so many miles from the boat. It's you know, angels, you know, fifteen or whatever, you yep. know, which is yep. fifteen thousand feet. And I get close. I see, and I call out, and I join up, and it's an F eighteen. I go, well, son of a bitch, that's not, that's not definitely not, <laughs> that's not him. No, skipper, that's not my skipper did a transition. <laughs> 
<laughs> then I joined on an A6E, okay. uh, and it was a, it was a it was gaggle of airplanes. Everybody's trying to go north, get to a target. So the skipper said, "Hey, just hey, run a rendezvous. Meet me like 80 miles north of the boat, at, you know, whatever, and we'll rendezvous there. Get out of this mess of airplanes." So it was always it was hard with four jets. Yeah, uh, and through all the command and control wickets, it just made it very difficult compared to most. All the other Harrier squadrons are flying in section, which we kind of wanted to do, but the, the, the skipper, the ops or whatever, the, hey, we're going to a division. So uh, it was just hard to lead four jets around in that. And the weather was always a problem sometimes, or, you know, now you got the smoke oil burning from the, uh, the Iraqis that, that set all the oil fields on fire. It was, you know, all the fog and friction of war was all there, right? You know, right. to a point. And now you're trying to get the ship. Latest and greatest of 60s technology to join up on. Yeah. Lights on the yeah, side exactly. of the Yeah, airplane. yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> right. Find, find right. And I call light and, and try to rendezvous <laughs> on it, you know, and hope that's your guy. Wow. So so Woody did ask me, hey, Lawman, if you would lead this first one, I'd really appreciate it. And I'll take the next one or two, whatever, you know. So I'm like, ah. I was kind of reluctant because, again, early morning, we're going to be the bed late. We can go late. It's already probably, you know, 2200, 10 o'clock at night, maybe. Yep. We got to get up at 03, 03.30 for early brief. Early brief. Oof. Uh, and uh, four ship up at night. Like, oh, geez. So I said, okay, I'll do it. I'll take the lead. And we kind of talked about that, that historically in combat, multiple airplanes over a target. Uh, and we were not a reattack. I know some guys uh, got, got hit, maybe reattack. And we were on their first pass and got the abort call. So we were not doing a circle the wagons coming back in a rear attack we were on our very first pass in that target area and here's what i wanted to talk about too because there's some, a lot of confusion and, and i understand that when we got assigned that target area uh, by the command and control center the you know the dask if you remember that the dasketeers right you know gave us someone hey here go to this here's your lat long here's your target area to contact combat i think it was combat zero five the two seat f-18 on this frequency and that's your target I read it back, and then two, three, and four uh, acknowledged that, that I had read back that lat long correctly. We all plugged it into our upfront control, into the system, the inertial mm-hmm. navigation system, and I did an alpha check. Lawman shows a target bearing, you know, 330 for 78 miles. Two, three, four, which means they agree. Right. So, yeah. you know, because otherwise not garbage in, garbage out. We're all, we all think this target is there. Right. And uh, so it turns out after the war, when we sat down face to face with at least a backseater from Combat 05 in El Toro, California, uh, he said we cleared up a lot of the uh, this confusion. We were nowhere near the F-18. He was well south of us. We got sent to a bogus or not say bogus. We got sent to a bad target area. Oh, so God. four Harriers alone. And I wouldn't say unafraid. <laughs> we were well north uh of friendlies well north of the other jets working targets north of kuwait city but south of us you were it was uh, early as they say way out in indian country then way out in indian country wow. by yourself and i knew that when wow. i when i plotted the uh long on a map i had in the copy of course you carry all kinds of maps yeah uh, and we didn't have digital movement map in the harry or that back then like the hornets did so i i, I had to pull out a map and say, heads up we're going into southern iraq we had not been in the southern iraq yet uh, so I knew that that kind of gave me, you know, my spider sense is already kind of tingling that, okay, boy, uh, maybe things, uh, but we're going into Southern, just so we'll heads up and uh, everybody, you know, two, three, four. And I said, Hey, circle on me and we're going to go down below and then we'll push North. Right. So we got sent essentially to a target area that nobody else is working because when I talked to the two seat F-18 combat zero five on that TAD frequency, the tactical frequency, yep. he gave me a weather update and thread update. He said, and it was about the same weather, about 5,000 foot overcast. But uh, he said he'd only seen some light AAA and small arms. He had not seen any SAM activity. That was okay. Good. Yeah. Cause for the Harrier, we knew at that point that four other Harriers had been shot down up to that point. Right. Uh, two missing in action. And uh, one guy had been rescued by friendlies. I think just a day or two prior uh, paper. And I think you right. talked about maybe talking to him. So he, he was very fortunate. He flew a crippled jet for a while, and then he ejected and was rescued by, I believe, Marines on the ground. Right. Uh, but my understanding, said, a quick funny on that was my understanding, and we'll get it from him, but it, he, you know, he landed. That he was vapor, coming. Right? Yeah, vapor. 
and he, he landed yeah. and he saw, he saw them. He saw the Marines and he's like, oh, there they are. They're waving to him. And so he starts going towards them and they're trying to wave him off because he's in a minefield. <laughs> and they're trying to say, oh my there's God. no way to tell him to <laughs> stop. Stop. Yeah, stop <laughs> he's, moving. Yeah. He's just trotting through a minefield like, oh, friendlies. <laughs> Oh so, yeah, yeah. You know what could go wrong? So oh, sorry, a to dangerous place, yeah. no doubt. Yeah, yeah I mean, right. War, we war you can get around. hurt. Yeah, you know. And I showed you that uh, 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 Woody's uh, nine millimeter pistol was left to his pistol, right? So we all carry uh, yes. and just shoot nine millimeter Beretta. Yep. So and some of us kind of joked around that the reason you carry as a as a pilot in a single seat jet a nine millimeter pistol of any type of pistol is when you if you get shot down over guys you just been dropping bombs on, you know they're not gonna be happy to see you, right? It's not going to be, if you survive the ejection, you're not going to get a very warm reception. We knew that from Vietnam, Korea, and yeah. even the guys that got picked up, you know, Raz and uh, uh, the other two Harrier guys that were peeled, that was got the hell beat out of them. I mean, right. went through like gauntlets, right. you know, broken bones, steel pipes, rifle yeah. butts. Uh, yeah. And you can understand that. You're the enemy. They just shot you down. You've been trying to drop bombs and kill these guys. So uh, we kind of joked around. The reason you have a nine millimeter pistol on your vest is that, if you get shot down and you're immediately surrounded by several hundred of the enemy, uh, you, they, you take your pistol out and you throw it onto the ground so they can see that you are completely unarmed. You know, like get rid of that pistol because you're not going to take, yeah. you know, 15 <laughs> rounds, two mags and have a firefight with you know, 700 Iraqi soldiers, you know. Exactly. But yeah, so, uh, yeah, so uh, Vapor was certainly lucky that Marines uh, picked them up. Yeah. But anyway, the bottom line, we knew there was a threat. We knew we could not get hit in the Harrier. The Harrier, not one single Harrier in combat, even to this day, has survived getting hit by any explosive ordnance. I think Fig had mentioned that about there's just no redundancy. There's no structure. It's a lightweight jet. Right. You have to be able to hover there's the no jet. There's no spare room. Yeah. Every, nothing, every yeah. piece inside that fuselage is taken up by something vital. And, uh, and fuel. And you know, the AVAB yep. carried a lot more gas than the AV-8A because they put a lot more fuel cells and the fuselage and wings. So the whole wing was eventually full of fuel. The fuselage has fuel tanks all around, all around it. You're going to have anything that hits on your airplane, you're going to explode. Things are going to fall apart. Uh, so we knew that. So when the F-18 said, hey, it's a, it's a target-rich environment. Here's the weather. Uh, some light AAA, uh, but no SAMs. That, okay, good. Yeah, so no we go down to play. All right. Yep, surface air yeah. missiles. So we go inside the... Uh, uh, go down and hit, and north of Kuwait City uh, to the wrong target area. Bottom line, uh, I didn't know that till a year later. Figured that out. That wow. Where were you guys? At? How come you never saw us? We never saw the F eighteen. He never saw us. He never saw the Sams, and he was confused by that too. So for you know the whole fog and friction of war, you talk about that. You know Sun Tzu and all that, and it, it's true. I mean, you can really have your stuff together, but uh, sometimes you just get dealt a bad hand. And so we got sent to a, a bad target area uh, and Intel, what we were able to put together uh, through those guys and some other sources that fairly good chance we, uh, we were attacking a uh, Republican Guard unit. The Hammurabi Division of the Republican sure. Guard is based on the intel we got where they were operating at, where we were that morning, pretty good probability. So these are highly trained, well-equipped, uh, more mercenary type Right. Iraqi soldiers, professional uh, soldiers, not conscripts, professionals, not, school. not conscripts. Yeah. Who are looking to, we've been dropping bombs on those guys too. And they tend to just kind of run away from the equipment and abandon it. Uh, so we probably picked the fight that morning or the target area with, uh, you know, some very well-trained, well-equipped professional Iraqi soldiers in Southern Iraq. Uh, and we, you know, and you get, we're going back, you can never go back and, and change. You know, I feel guilty about all that uh, as a flight lead. I live with that guilt of uh, having a really good friend of mine fly with me in combat. Right. And then not to bring him back to the ship alive uh, and to bring him all the way back home uh, in a transfer case to be buried. And a, and a patchware, you know, a, a weapons and tactics instructor, a really yeah, solid right. aviator and a good guy to boot, you know, right. well loved, well respected by everybody. Uh, and some guys, why were you there? So I've, I've been asked that question. Why, what, why were you guys down there? Well, that's where we got sent. You know, we were Marines. We got handed the target area. Uh, we went where we were told to go based on what we knew at the time. And we thought we were working with an F-18, two-seat Hornet, in the same target area. And we were not. We were basically four Harriers below a solid cloud deck in engine country uh, by ourselves. So that's kind of – some of that I wanted to kind of clear up a little bit. Uh, I lived with that guilt for a long, yeah. long time. Uh, 
And about two or three years ago, I'd been in contact with uh, Woody's uh, widow, mm-hmm. Donned over the years, and uh, right. and Ann, the little girl he had never seen. And about two or three years ago, uh, we agreed to meet in uh, Greenville, North Carolina, uh, and have dinner and like an Applebee's. Did I tell you the story? I don't know. No, don't no, no, no. Nope. Uh-huh. So uh, I was given a, uh, a lithograph, a Harrier lithograph, uh, by the Marine Corps Aviation Association that they were going to award to his family of the Harrier with uh, Woody's name on it from the Marine Corps Aviation Association. And so we met. Uh, I gave them a lift, though. They were very appreciative of that. I did the daughter, and they took it home. The daughter he'd never seen, you know, who's now in her 20s. Uh, And uh, then I felt compelled. You know, the Paul Harvey, you know, the rest of the story. Right. right. That they had never heard because uh, Donda knew the story for the most part. And I'd written an article at the Gazette magazine, and she'd encouraged me to write, and uh, was published and edited, of course. So I felt compelled to tell her the rest of the story about uh, Woody was supposed to lead that sortie that morning. Uh, and he, he asked me if I would lead it. So of course, again, it could have been anybody. It's the, the fog of war. Right. Uh, he got shot down as dash four. Uh, and I came back to the boat and, you know, turn things around. What, who knows what would happen if uh, we would have st- stuck with the script handed out that night about, hey, Woody's going to lead it. Mystic would have been dash two, maybe Pee Wee three or me or three or four, you know, and then we swapped it out a little bit. And we always took turns leading. So I I told Donda and the the daughter about that. And I just want to get off my chest, you know, that, hey, it really should have been me. It should have been me. Uh, Woody was a great guy, great father. I mean, great husband, excited about being a father and never got to experience that. Uh, it was all these years I just carried that kind of with me, and I wanted to get survivor's off the chest. Survivor's guilt, man. It's yeah, I guess you call it guilt. that. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, but they took it. They were very gracious, uh, very gracious. Uh, in fact, um, uh, not too long after that, uh, the state of Kentucky Aviation Hall of Fame inducted Reg Underwood Woody into the Kentucky Aviation Hall of Fame. They had a big ceremony with some other yeah. inductees. That was pretty That's cool awesome. at the uh, museum there in Kentucky, Lexington, Kentucky his hometown and uh the family of course was invited to come uh, and they asked me uh, if i would speak on behalf of the family uh so the daughter and and, and donda donda and ann came on stage to get the award but i spoke on behalf of the family about what had happened to, to red Underwood. oh that's awesome and desert storm yeah so we they're great people and we get along well but i would you know so i just wanted to tell that rest of that story uh and i've had the i've had hair your guys ask me over the years, especially early on, what, what the hell were you guys doing? What were you thinking? Why were you flying below a solid undercast in that area with, with Sam's? Well, you know, we didn't know that at the time <laughs> that we were going to operate yeah. by ourselves below a solid undercast and, uh, and, uh, uh enemy territory right. where they well equipped. Correct me if missiles. I'm wrong, but you went there thinking you had a two seat fast fact telling you, Hey, there's been no Sam activity and we're over here. Come on down. Come on down. Exactly. Exactly. Come on down. Target rich environment. Come down and play. And, and in fact, That's I think you're did. probably pretty fortunate you didn't lose another two or three airplanes on that sort of. Yeah. I think Mystic had, I think Mystic had a missile or two chasing him. So I mean, it was, you know, it was, we're certainly fortunate. And Pee Wee was great. You know, Pee Wee is a WTI also on my wing, uh, you know, and he had kids at home, right. You know, and he wanted to get home. And I had two kids at home also. And, uh, you know, you want to, you want to hang out as long as you can, but at some point you're out of gas, you're in bad guy country, you know, weather's, you just watch one guy get shot down. At some point, you got to go back, you know, and right. hand it off to somebody else. Anyway, that's kind of the rest of what I wanted to kind of talk about a little bit when, in regards oh, to. Oh, uh, I'm glad Ridge you Underwood. did. I would, uh, yeah, I wasn't aware of that. That uh, you know, no. I, I had an inkling that you guys had switched and all that, but um, uh, you know, I hope I you don't feel guilty that you know. And I know it's hard not to. It's easy for me to sit here 30 years later, and right. not been in that sortie and not been in combat, but. Uh, um, that, you know, and, and I don't mean this to sound right, but you know, that's the breaks of naval air, right? You hear that all the time, bad things yeah. happen to good people. And it, and no we all knew it, yeah. that going in. So, yeah. And the Harrier, I mean, you can, you just can't get hit. I mean, the Hornets, five Hornets got hit, flew back into Saudi Arabia, but the Harrier, I'm not, I'm not disparaging the jet, the jet, uh, you know, can do some pretty amazing things, but you bottom line is you cannot get hit in the Harrier by anything explosive. 
right. you're you're going down. Not one. The British, Falklands, uh, Serbia, Yugoslavia, British Sea Harry got shot down in that conflict, and then the uh, five Marines uh, that were lost uh, Harriers in Desert Storm. It, we we exp- you know increased uh, you know with 180 chaff and flare, so we wanted more expendables. So hopefully you don't get hit, you know. So they have done some things to increase the survivability, but it still boils down to a single engine jet with a lot of gas all around it, and the engine uh, heat source is right near, you know, like thick, I mentioned thick yeah. mid fuselage. You get hit right. by a heat seeking missile; it's right there at mid fuselage, and there goes your turbine section immediately. Yeah. That's what inches inches from yeah. the hot nozzles. That yeah, right. that's the pusher. Turbine that's what makes you fuel. go <laughs> fuel cell. Yeah, right. yeah. yeah. even it's if you link. don't get the fuel, you kill your turbine. That that that's what pushes you downrange. Uh, yeah, you're, you're done. Yeah, you're you, yeah. you might fly for a while. I guess you know vapor for a while, but uh, yeah. Not for, not, you're not going to go back and land it. You know, no. so. Well, it seems like as good a place as any to stop for the week. So we want to say thank you for your service and thank you for joining us, Lawman. Glad to be here, guys. My pleasure. As we uh, mentioned before, uh, we spent more than five hours with Lawman, and there's a lot more to come. Uh, there's a lot of humor left in the time with him and amazing tales of his time with the Blue Angels, which I truly enjoyed. Yeah. Uh, while this show was in some ways um, difficult, Maybe a little hard to hear. We share it because it's the nature of military aviation to experience tragedy. Uh, The men and women flying our most sophisticated aircraft in the tip of the spear are trained exceptionally well and go into battle with their eyes wide open to the possibility of never returning. We were privileged to have known and served with Woody and we honor his sacrifice, never uh, forgetting that He volunteered to be where he was that day 31 years ago. Lest we forget, his bride and his daughter also sacrificed a normal life with dad at home. And we also offer our sincere gratitude and prayers for all of them and all the families whose lives have been shattered by war over the last 20 plus years. Thank you for your service and your sacrifice. Oh, well said, Fig. We're going to break it up a little bit here and have another guest next week, uh, Fatty, who has another incredible story that's inspirational in the face of overwhelming odds. Uh, you know, I kind of blindsided you with a uh, a story of uh, Sheriff right. several episodes back, you know, and so <laughs> yeah, turnabout's fair play. Uh, at least you didn't do it to me live on the air, but uh, <laughs> this is another incredible story of survival and challenges overcome. Like uh, Sheriff and Lawman, people hearing his story are going to be very impressed, so. Uh, look for that next week. We want to thank you for joining us each week. We know you have the option of listening to more than 3 million shows. The fact that you're listening to ours is humbling. Wouldn't you say, repeat? Absolutely. It's amazing. We, we, we hope it's worth your time. We are having a blast. And uh, I hope that uh, is conveyed because I, I love hearing all these stories. And and I'm actually, some of these guys we already know, and some we're meeting for the first time when we interview them. And it's it's been incredible. If, if you like our show, would you please subscribe on your iPad or iPhone using Apple Podcast app? We also appreciate any reviews uh, on, on those apps. Thanks. If you don't happen to be an Apple person, you can find us anywhere you listen to podcasts. We'd also like to thank a couple of people who are uh, making this show possible. First of all, Dave Hamilton over at the Mac Geek Gap podcast. His technical expertise and advice got us up and running and his continued support is deeply appreciated. Dave hosts the Mac Geek Gab podcast, the Business Brain podcast, and the Gig Gab podcast for musicians. Also, our appreciation goes to our sponsor, RobinsBirdBrainDesigns.com. I can say uh, personally that uh, her product is amazing. Uh, work with Robin to get your most difficult gifts done early, which I did, thanks to Robin. Uh, This year, classy custom designs and uh, personalized slate coasters with your organization's logos, names on it, are only the beginning of what she can provide for you. Until next week, stay safe and check six. And for another drink, he might sing you a song. He's a hard-hearted bastard of a day long gone by a mix of emotion and laughter in his eye worn out junkie on adrenaline and speed fighter pilot 
He's the last of the breed. Yeah, he'll tell stories on how we fought the war. Using words and phrases that you've never heard before. He'll talk of death as if it were a lie. Then speak of good friends and good times. As he looks up to the sky And tell a joke That no man should ever tell But it don't bother him Cause he's seen both Heaven and hell He's a hard-hearted bastard Of a day long gone by a mix up and laughter in his eye One out junkie On adrenaline and speed Fighter pilot He's the last of the breed Fighter pilot He's the last of the breed